everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer for Billboard, Variety, Goldmine, Access.com, and wherever else I can drop my pen name. Um, I'm uh, welcoming you to another session of things we said today where we talk about the Beatles past, present, and we even kind of look into our crystal ball sometime and and uh, predict the future. Um, let me introduce you to our two regular co-hosts uh, from the state of Maine, um, our musicologist and formerly once upon a time was the head of the Beatle desk at the New York Times and now writes for the Wall Street Journal and uh, is the author of Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and the Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, um, Mr. Alan Coson. Hello, Alan. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. I got that all out in yeah, one breath. Incredible. How about that? <laughs> I know. Um, and from the state of Connecticut, um, the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hey, Steve. Hi, everybody. And me, I'm the author of Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. I never plugged that, but I'm going to plug it today. Anyway, um, we have uh, some news to go through first. Um, speaking of the monkeys, uh, Michael Nesmith announced, or actually Mickey Dolenz announced yesterday that he's going to be joining uh, Mike, or Mickey Dolenz as a special guest on two shows this week in the Los Angeles area for you, those of you in that area. Um, by the time this show goes up, I believe the shows will be happening. But uh, one of them is at the Canyon Club in Agoura, which I've been to. I saw Peter Asher there a couple of years ago. And it's a nice little club. And, and some of the people that uh, play there are absolutely astounding. I think Brian Wilson uh, has played there, among other people. But anyway, it's a great little place. But uh, that should be fun. Ringo did a Billboard interview this week talking about uh, Tom Petty, who just who, by the way, is on the cover of the latest – Billboard magazine that I just got in the mail today, um, and there's a bunch of articles in here uh, and ads uh, uh, memorializing Tom Petty. Ringo says in the Billboard interview, I'll miss Tom. Tom was a good friend. I played with Tom. Tom played with me. I got to know him over the years. Really got to know him when he was in the Wilburys because of George Harrison. All through my career, we've lost really great friends and people who aren't my friends, but were great musicians and writers. In our business, we've lost them very young as well. But overall, there's still a lot of us out there doing what we do. Also in Billboard, in that issue, is a a full-page Paul McCartney ad. Or I should say it's an ad about Paul McCartney. It's from SMG, which is the concert promoter, and says, Thank you, Paul McCartney. Three nights, three SMG venues, three venue records broken, one amazing artist. And at the bottom, it lists Interest Bank Arena, Chesapeake Energy Arena, and CenturyLink Center. So interesting that uh, that Paul got a full-page ad. There's, uh, uh, in, back to Ringo, there, uh, he... Uh, Made a, uh, as promised, he had made a one thousand, a hundred thousand dollar donation to the Vegas victims and dedicated his first show at the um, blank blank Planet Hollywood. Planet, Planet Hollywood. Hollywood. Thank you at the Planet Hollywood uh, in Vegas uh, to the victims. The set list that evening included one song from the new album, the title song "Give More Love," um, and I know a couple of people commented on Facebook when I posted that information um that they were kind of disappointed that Ringo didn't do more songs from the album and push it a little harder I honestly didn't expect him to do more but uh what do you guys think Alan you want to start Alan sure yeah I mean I think it's a kind of a missed opportunity because this album has so much good stuff that um he could have added to his set list I mean some of which have members of his band on them, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, it, it seems to me that, you know, this is an album that, you know, a lot of people kind of were a little more excited about than Ringo album than they normally are with Ringo albums, and maybe, um, you know, it's not going to be played on the radio if he's going to promote it, and people are going to perhaps, you know, 
be persuaded to buy it. It's going to be through seeing him play the songs live and saying, hey, I'll go get that, you know? I, I, right. So, so I don't really understand. Um, I don't understand what he's doing. I mean, I, I, it's, I understand that he, play, he wants to play the oldies and, uh, you know, it's an entertainment rather than a promotional tour. But... You know, he's making a new album. I, I, I would have to think that anybody who bothers to make a new album wants as many people to hear it as can hear it. Right. So why not play some of, you know, there's there's a number of good songs on that. I don't see why he is playing just one. And the one he's playing is, you know, I don't know. To me, it when we talked about it, it you know, it's an okay song, but it, kind of a generic recent Ringo song, whereas some of the other songs really have a lot more going for them. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of all the songs on the on the album, I was surprised he picked that one. Ken? I agree totally with Alan, especially after all the times we said that we're on the road again is a natural. Right. Uh, just, you know, by the topic itself, and it's a great rocker, and it would work really well live. And Steve Lukather wrote the song with Ringo. Steve Lukather is in the band with Ringo, yeah. and uh, you know you've got all these other songs that I really think would work very well live on stage. I just think a song like "Speed of Sound," you know, uh, mm -hmm. it just has a, a good. It would really work well as a live song. And um, I think Ringo has resigned himself to the fact that he's not going to sell like he used to. I know several years ago he was saying, I know I'm not going to sell like Britney Spears. But at the same time, if you're not going to promote your own work, <laughs> then you're part of the reason why it's not selling. Although yeah. you can't expect Ringo to be up there in the top ten with this album. But he could have an influence on him, at least being on the charts. Yeah. And uh, I don't understand why he can't do a couple of songs for the new album, at least while it's brand new and he just released it. Mm -hmm. It's another thing if it's a year later, maybe he doesn't want to give it as much attention. But it just came out. So right. I just I don't understand why he wouldn't at least do We're on the Road again. Right. You know, well, I, the one thing, in, uh, as I mentioned in my story, is I was told – um, that the set list will get will be added to once he leaves Vegas. Uh, they're playing a little shorter set while they're in Vegas, which I, 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 that I don't really understand. I mean, why the set ha set list has to be shorter in Vegas? But well, once, you know something, uh, yeah. Ringo has played at a lot of casinos. Casinos, and, right? And cas casinos, as a rule, give you a shorter show because. They want you to go out there and gamble. Right. It's always been that way. And I've noticed that when I've seen Ringo at uh, Mohegan Sun in the past. That is, that's true. It has been a little bit shorter, those shows. And all concerts in particular that I've seen at a casino. Mm -hmm. So that could, be, that could be the reason why. Well, the, 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 the question then is, will he add a song from the new album once, we, once he gets you know, out of Vegas? So, or will he, you know, how many songs he will add, what he will add, and, you know, whether they'll be from that album. So, we'll see. Yeah. I, I, you know, I hope so. He, I, also, I hope. he also may not have had enough time to rehearse with the band a new song. So, I mean, he's got one new song in there. They usually, you know, they, they usually jam rehearsals at the beginning of the tour, you know, before the tour starts. I mean, they take like one or two days. So... That may be it too, and you know, I, I I know that when I've seen him later in the tour, he, there's really a difference. You can tell that they really gel together as the tour, you know, goes on. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, okay. are you are you seeing him on this tour, Ken? I'm seeing him for two shows. I'm okay. seeing him at the Beacon in uh, New York City, and one of the shows in New Jersey, back to back on the 15th and 16th. Okay. Because I'm, I, he's not playing California this time. Um, so, of November, by the way, fifteenth and sixteenth of November. Okay. Anyway, all right. So there, there we go. Oh, and also, in that issue of Billboard, the Beatles hold three spots on the Billboard 200. Abbey Road is 134. Beatles one is 173, and Sgt. Pepper is squeaking in at 199. <laughs> So, anyway, all right. 
let's get on to the show or to the main part of the show and that's to talk about uh to continue the discussion actually that we started a couple of weeks ago about uh where we were talking about the uh, whether the Beatles were keeping their legacy uh how well they were responding to or how well they were taking care of their legacy through their releases um we've talked about the solo Beatles in two shows and now we're going to talk about just the Beatles and you know um i mean this is one of those questions that uh you know that people debate all the time and i don't know that anybody will ever be really satisfied i mean they have done some good things but they've also done some less than good things um uh, i'm glad they finally put out the hollywood bowl for example but they didn't put out everything which i wouldn't have expected them to especially with the audio problems on the one show but at least that finally is out there and it's not uh, although it was bootleg for years you know so that's a good thing it's just there are so many things that they could do that they have not done and we keep hoping uh you know let it be as a gaping hole in the in the uh releases i mean they have they have done a lot not so much uh recently i mean everything they've put out recently has been basically you know this the stereo vinyl box the the uh the cd at least they put out the mono cd box which i thought was a great thing the love album surprised me i i really didn't think that was going to be all that great but it actually is very listenable and one of my fa- it's actually one of my favorite albums now the capital albums even though they put out the uh, u.s box which isn't really the u.s albums the cap the two ca- uh two volumes of capital albums i think are a great thing um a lot of people uh, i know a lot of British people, or some British people I know kind of wonder about that, but uh, I thought that was great that they did that. Let It Be Naked, I didn't particularly care for when it first happened. Uh, That's grown on me a lot. I really like the sound quality there. The anthologies I didn't particularly like. Uh, I think uh, the anthology albums were piecemeal. The anthology video I think is great. And why we don't have a Blu-ray on that, uh, I don't know. I pre- I think I predicted last year it was coming, and it hasn't. But anyway, um, but I think there's there's a lot that they can do, um, a, an awful lot. Ken, you wanna you wanna start? Hmm. This is a pretty complicated topic. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Because. Um, when we approach a topic like this, whether it's group or solo, I look at two two different things. I look at what's important for new and casual fans and what's more important for what I consider to be hardcore fans. And you guys can disagree on this all you want. But, I mean, when you were talking just now, Steve, about whether or not you're pleased, it's more about whether all the things that you'd like to see released are released. But I'm just as concerned about whether or not new fans discover the Beatles. And this is something that you know, I've been feeling even stronger as the years go on, because unless you do have new young fans discover them, then your audience will just get older and die off. And um, that's not to say that the older fans don't count. They, every fan, every level of fan should count. But um, I'm pretty much pleased overall with what's been done. I think most important is whether or not the catalog always stays in print uh, and whether or not it's the best sound quality. And I'm still so pleased with the 2009 remasters. I think it's so important that periodically they get remastered again in whatever format is the format of the moment, whether it's Blu-ray, audio, whatever it is that you want. Every 10 to 15 years, maybe, the catalog should be remastered. So that's something that I think should always be of concern. I love the fact that the Sgt. Pepper box set came out this year, and I think it's going to open up the doors to the rest of the Beatles catalog. That's just my own general opinion, even though we've heard that there's a very good chance that next year there'll be something on the White Album. But I do think, like I said before, if you if you divide between the, the new and casual fans with the hardcore fans, 
you need to keep putting out stuff that would please the new fans and casual fans too, and also please the other ones. I do believe, and maybe because the Sgt. Pepper uh, release came out this year, that that will open the floodgates for the entire Beatles catalog. But I'm not necessarily thinking about all the outtakes coming out. I think the most important outtakes should be out. The outtakes that show an evolution in the songs, how they developed, if there are versions that were noticeably different or a different arrangement than what came out. And every single Beatles album deserves a remaster with a bonus CD with outtakes. Now, you can, you can debate whether they deserve box sets and more elaborate packaging and booklets and the mono with the stereo and everything else. You could probably, I, I certainly wouldn't disagree with Rubber Soul and Revolver getting that treatment as well as the later albums. But I think that's, that's what should be done. You know, through the years, uh, and I'm, I'm looking back to, you know, the 70s, even though the Beatles had nothing really to do with the compilations that came out in the 70s, they had no control over those things. That was a pretty important decade for the Red and the Blue albums to come out, for rock and roll music to come out. They sold extremely well. The compilations kind of fizzled after a while on the Beatles in the early 80s with real music and 20 greatest hits. But then later on in the 90s, you had Live at the BBC and the Beatles anthology. And I happen to disagree with you, Steve. I thought those were really good releases. Not perfect, but they gave us a glimpse of what lied in the vaults for some of us that didn't know. and had some really good, interesting outtakes that we never heard before. You know, I think when you hear takes one for got to get you into my life and tomorrow never knows which are the highlights for me because it's so noticeably different from what was to follow that's the kind of thing that i'd like to hear more of you know on the other beatles albums if it ever gets the kind of treatment that i just recommended my Uh, my big my big problem with the anthology is the way they they spliced them around and and cut them up and and messed. Oh yeah. I think if they had, if they had, just put the the individual outtakes out, without messing around with them, I, I would have been fine. But they didn't do that, and some well, of the, and I think they really botched that. But well, they did that on some of them, but there's there's plenty of tracks on the Beatles anthology that they didn't touch, at all. Mm. Yeah, you know, there's the ones. There's, uh, yes, it is six in my head. That, that, I, that just irritates me to to have to, you know, the way they mess that up. You know, I, you know, so, I think we, I think we all liked it at the time. I think the dislike right. is now retrospective because we've seen what they did with the pepper box, was a, which was a totally different approach. But at the time it came out, I, I think we were all pretty thrilled to have anything you know that amount of unreleased material you know six discs mm. worth you know well no okay. i think there were i think there were complaints at the time and and but remember too i, I remember that ringo said that's all there is there ain't no more no more yeah, yeah. which which mm. yeah yeah everybody knew you know that was uh, that was uh, not true but no, I think I remember. I do remember hearing complaints about that at the time, and it, in fact, it seems to me I read them in Beatle fan um, at the time. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and your point about the BBC uh, live at the BBC is, you know, you you are right. Those are those are great. I mean, it, I know there are people that would wish that the uh, the Great Dane sets would have been the model for what the the Beatles put out, but that wasn't going to happen. I just it just wasn't, you know. Yeah. Why? Well, I mean, <laughs> but why? What? Yeah, you know, there are a lot of people, uh, like you know, various jazz people and other rock groups, you know, particularly jazz. I'm thinking, uh, you know, where they put out a complete radio recording set, you know, it and it it goes on for as many discs as well. The, at this point, the Great Dane wouldn't even be adequate because there's been a lot of material that's been found since then. But, you know, why? Why? I, I can't think of a reason why there could not have been a complete BBC release. Well, I just think that that does cater to the hardcore fan there. I mean, I love hearing all that stuff, but I'm not the average person. Hardcore and fan will reach about... into his pocket and take out his wallet and will buy them. So why not cater to the hardcore fan? I, th- I think at the time that the BBC albums came out, the um, the economic 
um, thought of the record companies was different. Now they'll do they'll there's more willingness to do that stuff than there was. Well, if if you're Sony. <laughs> Well, I mean, the look Beatles at, look aren't at, on Sony, well, right? But but I mean, go, let's go back to the anthology. I mean, that was supposed to be a six disc box set originally, hmm. and they split it up. Yeah. You know, so I mean, they uh, they didn't. I guess they didn't think that six discs as a box would sell, and yeah. so they you know they they carved it up, and I think that was probably the same kind of thinking that with the BBC that nobody would, would buy it. Although they could have actually done, for example, with what the band did with the last waltz and put out, you know, a two disc highlight version, Mm -hmm. but, uh, they didn't. So, but you know, uh, why do we have to have every recording out there? Because they're great. And we want to hear them. (laughs) (laughs) Because well, I really because think that it's it's still a small percentage of the fans that really want to hear them. I well, mean, I think, it's, I think it's larger than you think. I, I, I especially now, I think it, as the years go on, and as the original fa- fans get older and have the prospect of not hearing all this stuff, they want it more. Uh, well, I, I, I think I think there has to be some kind of compromise. I don't think everything should come out, but the most interesting ones should come out. Mm. I no, mean, I if, you I, listen, I, if you I, listen to the BBC stuff, for example, they did how many how many uh, recordings of "Please Please Me" on there, and who can really tell the difference between one and most of them? You know, so is it really that essential for that to come out? Um, if you listen closely, you can tell the difference. I mean, you know, when they when these things used to come out on vinyl bootlegs, I would take them home and I would play all the different versions together. I'd speed correct them so they'd be in the same key. And in some cases, I'd have one playing through one headphone and the second playing through the other headphone. And there are differences. And, you know, I mean, I was kind of interested at the time in figuring out which, you know, what? It, first of all, whether a new bootleg was going to have stuff that we didn't have before, and if it did, what it was, you know, and trying to sort of assign each of these performances to whatever date it was supposed to be, which was a lot of work, but it was fun. But they are a bit different. I mean, there's, you listen to all the Till There Was You recordings, and there's a, a bunch of those, and the solos are all a bit different. You know, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know I, I, used to, I used to equate those a little bit with, with, the, uh, with studio outtakes, because yeah. they, kind of, they actually kind of were. You know, I mean, they, they are and they aren't, but I mean, I used to listen to them, and I used to go, you know, I wonder how that figured in you know, the way that the song actually ended up, you know, that's the way I kind of used to look at those. So, yeah, in that case, you know, there is something valuable to be gained from those, especially those, especially those. Yeah. Those mm. BBC recordings are, you know, are... And especially um, if you do them in context with the announcer talking and the bits of interviews, and if you, you know, just having a bunch of tracks wouldn't be quite as good as... <laughs> as preserving the show more or less as it was. Maybe not all the other acts, but the Beatles segments. You know, it really gives you a feeling for the time and what was said and what they're doing at that particular point. And, um, you know, and there's one thing where the officially released versions, I think, also I was a little disappointed because they did some editing within the interviews and spoken parts. They're not the complete things that were said. They may take a phrase out or a sentence out or something like mm-hmm. that. And, you know, and why? Why? It's, there's, there's no real need. But yeah, I mean, I, I, w- I would like to see the, the full BBC archive come out at some point. It really ought to. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I've, I've listened to it all many times and have never thought, oh man, the same four songs again and again, you know, because they, you know, they did a lot of different stuff too, you know, they have all, all those songs that they never cut in the studio, which I think are probably at least in a, one example are all out now. I can't think of anything. That most of them, most of them are out, not all of them though. Not all. Especially the, especially the early, the, like the first one with Pete Best. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and and that's well, another that's another thing. The time element, you know, when they were, when those uh, songs were recorded, when they were done, you can hear differences in the vocals in the in the band itself. I'm talking about Pete Best versus Ringo. You know, there's there's a lot of elements there. I mean, that might be that might be something for a show yeah. that we could talk about it at some point. You know, but yeah, I mean, there's. So, Ken, did you, but, did, you, but, uh, did you finish yeah. your general comment about the legacy? No. Okay, um, go ahead. But but just to finish up on this, you know, it's one thing for us to talk about this and why we're fascinated with it. I just think if you distance yourself. The, you know, the casual fan out there or new new fans, I don't think they're going to go that deep into it. That's why I think, like I said, with the, the regular catalog, if you have one disc of outtakes, that's more than enough. Hmm. You know, and um, I, I am very concerned about new fans discovering the Beatles more so, I think, than whether or not the older folks get to hear everything that's that's not released. Well, that's, that's why that's why you opinion. also put out the two disc sampler set. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's a great release right there. <laughs> right. You're so talking you, about Live at the BBC. That that was a fantastic release. Right. And it has most of the songs that they didn't release for EMI. Right. So you do there. them both. You put out the two disc sampler and then if people, you know, even people may decide to go on and get the bigger set, but if the bigger set's not released, they can't. You know, if you're a casual okay. fan, you, you start with the two-disc set, you, you go through that. If you really end up liking it or listen to it, you know, over the years, you might say, you know, I, I, I gather there's an awful lot more of this stuff. Why don't I go buy the 14-CD set, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, then if you apply that logic, then you'd think that way about every single one of their albums and every single outtake should come out. Um, I kind of do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some people might think that's that's extreme. But, you know, again, we're talking, we're talking not, about the Beatles here. We're not talking about, um, well, I don't want to name any particular groups, but we are talking about the Beatles. So, OK, what else was I going to talk about? I think uh, over the years, even though the Beatles have nothing really much to do with this, when Beatles music is covered, I think that's very important, especially by new artists. And it gives new life to the Beatles catalog because new fans discover the old recordings that the Beatles made. I think that one thing that should change is that Beatles recordings should be in movies more. For so long, you'd never hear a Beatles song in a movie. I think that really helps to um, generate interest in the catalog. I mean, just where the Beatles are concerned, Twist and Shout is a song that became... Uh, I hit all over again because it was in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh-huh. And for, in all these years since, whenever you have a party of any kind, if they play 60s music, you're going to hear Twist and Shout. And that's not by some accident. I think the Beatles music needs to be heard in other outlets. Mm-hmm. Like, and that, and that, that you reminded me of something I forgot to mention. Um, on the top album sales chart in Billboard this week, the soundtrack for the Vietnam War, which has "Let It Be" on it, is number forty-nine. So, there you there you go. But, but you uh, know, this is thing- this is one like a, a problem that Apple had that they may have been correcting. You know, more recently that mm-hmm. they for a long time were refusing to license music, and sometimes even retroactively. There was this great British series called "Glittering Prizes." I don't know if you saw it. Uh, Frederick Raphael, it's about this group of kids who sort of go through, I guess, Cambridge, and it follows them all through their lives. And the music that they played, it started in the 50s and it ended in the 70s. The music they played was keyed to those eras. And there were a couple of Beatles songs in the series. One was they played Can't Buy Me Love, They played, I think, Get Back or For You Blue. When it came out on DVD years after it was broadcast, it it, it was shown here on PBS. It was a BBC thing. The Beatles songs were removed. And only the Beatles songs, so far as I know. I mean, all the other tracks that were in the soundtrack were there, I, I, I believe. But the Beatles songs, which naturally I was sort of looking forward to when those episodes came up, gone. Mm. 
And that's like just a silly decision, you know, for exactly the reasons that Ken said, you know, there's all kinds of reasons that you would associate a song with something, um, you know, beyond the song itself. And, and its appearance in a film, I think, is a big deal. Hmm. The one thing that I, I do believe we should have, and this would appeal to the, the new fans and the hardcore fans, is some kind of DVD of the Beatles live. Mm-hmm. You know, various live performances, and especially, you know, there are TV appearances that you can put on a DVD. Yeah. Like Blackpool Night Out. Right. Or um, Drop In, the Swedish TV show. Those kind of things. I mean, when we first heard about Eight Days a Week, we thought we were going to get all this unreleased live footage yeah. of the Beatles on stage. And we got a little bit of it. But there's a lot out there that you could put together that would appeal to every level of fan. Yeah. You know, and I, there really should be something like that. That would definitely preserve the Beatles' legacy because most fans don't know how great the Beatles were as a live band, mm-hmm. especially new fans. It's not going to it's not going to happen now. I mean, 8 days a week was their was their idea of that. Well, it may soon may eventually. I mean, they still do have a fully produced version of the Shea Stadium concert which they could release. Well, that's that's true too. You know, they could they could put out videos of live concerts. And, I mean, this is an avant-garde idea for Apple, apparently, but the soundtracks could be the actual same concert that's being seen in the footage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, here we go again. Well, I mean, not to be a monomaniac, but... <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. But that's uh, something I definitely feel should be done. I've been fairly pleased with a lot of the releases from the last 20 years. In fact, I think The Beatles' Love was an astounding success. I mean, it's been in Las Vegas now for 10 years. And imagine families who take their kids to see that, and maybe they're turned on by The Beatles' music because of that. So that was a really brilliant idea. It's actually 11 now. 11, okay, there you go. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So... um, you know, there have been a lot of good releases through the years. I did like Eight Days a Week, despite that one flaw that Alan always brings up. But, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that is more of a mainstream release. And as we mentioned, when that came out, I think one thing that's very important was when I read that Little Steven was making an effort to make sure that that documentary film would be available in colleges around the United States. So that's another great way for young people to discover the Beatles. Mm -hmm. I like hearing about all those efforts because you got to keep attracting the young fans. And um, if you can do that at the same time while winning over the the older fans, then that's a winning formula right there. So, But overall, I'm kind of pleased. I mean, yes, we we can bellyache that so much other stuff could come out, but I really think because of – the Sgt. Pepper release of this year, I think it's going to foreshadow what will happen in the near future. I don't think, we're, my, I don't think we're belly aching. Uh, I'm not saying us, but a lot of fans, you know, they're, they're never happy, no matter what comes out. Well, that's true. That's true. Alan, uh, your, your turn. Okay. Um, so, you know, when you talk about preserving the legacy, I think we're, we're, we're talking about several different things here. And what we've mainly been talking about is not so much preserving the legacy as making the legacy available to us. In terms of preserving the legacy, I think that the we don't really know what the solo guys have done. Um, but we know that with the group, EMI has gone through every single tape they have and have cataloged it. I mean, starting with John Barrett and then Lewis. And I mean, that was partly the book was really a byproduct of what EMI was really interested in, which is having a good catalog and everything sort of listened to and annotated. That's what they wanted out of it. Mm-hmm. And and the book, I think, was sort of, you know, almost a, a, a brilliant um sort of marketing outgrowth of what their original plan was. They've transferred all the stuff to digital. They've gone back and and transferred the multi-tracks before they were bounced down to digital so that you can now do remixes. I mean, in terms of preserving legacy, the stuff that we don't see that Apple and EMI, now Universal, have done 
really is they've done a serious job of that let me ask one thing you brought up something that was kind of interesting they have not gone through all the solo tapes and cataloged them well, we don't know that because they each, you know, I, I, I feel pretty sure from what we can tell that the Harrison family is doing it with George's tapes. Mm-hmm. Um, it looks like um, MPL bet- is doing it pretty thoroughly with McCartney's tapes because as they do each of these, even if they hadn't done it before, as they do each of these reissues, mm-hmm. like that's a lot of material to go through and they're going and through I think, it. And I think you can almost think, you can almost say that the uh, Sean... You know, the Lennon estate has gone through his stuff, too. Yeah, actually, yeah, I think they have. I think they have, because Yoko has remixed them once, remastered them once. Um, I think they... uh, I know that when they were putting together that anthology box, they went through everything. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that, you know... I guess they didn't have to do what EMI has done with, you know, going back to the pre-bounced multi-tracks because by the time they were doing the solo stuff, they probably had as many tracks as they needed and didn't need to do that. So, mm-hmm. um, so mm-hmm. that, that was probably a little easier for them. In terms of Ringo, I don't know what he's done, but I do know that a few years ago, his publicist said that he was sort of collecting copies of the interviews he'd done, and she asked me for copies of the ones I had done with him. Um, so, you know, he must be putting together some kind of an archive. Well, he's, and, he's told Chris Carter a couple of times he was working on, you know, some kind of collection, but we haven't, we have yet to see that. Yeah. Which is really kind of a shame as we talked about when we were talking about his solo legacy. Right. What so, do you mean by collection? I mean, I heard that he said uh, an Apple years box set, like what George had. Yeah, I'm try I think I think that's I think that's what I'm referring to. Yeah, he was but I mean any kind of anthology of his stuff, you know, I mean obviously hasn't there hasn't been any big, you know, anthology as we talked about when we when we talked about the Ringo thing 2 weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um so no, but he he has said that there is some kind of a project that he's been that's been in his, you know, that has been in his vision. Right. But it hasn't. But it hasn't happened. So, so with Go the ahead, group, um, with the group, I mean, in addition to you know, when when I think of preserving the legacy, I'm thinking more in terms of what they're doing with the raw materials that they have apart from what they're giving us, and mm-hmm. um, have to give them pretty high marks for all of that transferring and getting back to the you know the the multi tracks, you know the pre bounce downs. Um, and all of that, because that will make a lot of things possible that had never been possible before, um, you know, the remixes and things like that. Um, mm. they, similarly, Apple has spent a lot of time seeing to its film archives. I mean, for a while, Ron Fermanac was there. They've had other people um, going through and cataloging and just looking through a lot of footage that they have collected where, you know, it hadn't necessarily been looked at. And that's why we have the Hey Bulldog promo. You know, they sort of knew what that was, they, but hadn't ne- necessarily had all of the raw materials before and then realized that, wait a minute, we do have enough to actually show them doing Hey Bulldog. That in itself is kind of a big thing. You know, I don't know how, much, how many other things like that there could be, probably not much. But, uh, you know, they so they're getting their film archive together, too. Um, getting it out seems to be a little slow. Things move mm-hmm. slowly there. But nevertheless, we talk about things moving slowly. And, I mean, I am one of the biggest complainers and whiners. But to be fair, <laughs> I have, you know, various playlists set up in my Beatles stuff on my computer. And one of them is archival material. And for archival material they've released, meaning Hollywood Bowl, BBC, Anthology, uh, the 1963 bootleg recordings that was Apple iTunes only, um, Mm -hmm. and then the Pepper stuff, um, you know, subtract a few because I have both versions of the first BBC album on there, and I have all of Pepper, including, you know, the remixed, uh, not just the outtakes, but all told, that playlist is um, 594 tracks. And that doesn't include remixes. 
my remix playlist, which has Let It Be Naked, Yellow Submarine Song Track, One, and, you know, Love. That's 129 tracks. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if you, if you consider that the Beatles as a group released, you know, a bit over 200 tracks, you know, maybe, I, I'm not sure what the final total is. Um, I could look on that playlist, but since I have both mono and stereo and all kinds of other stuff, I'll say the ni- the nineteen eighty seven CDs playlist has two hundred seventeen files on it. So they've really released multiples of what had been out in the official catalog. So you know, to be fair, much as I would like to see every single take, every single BBC recording, and every single live track released they haven't done that bad a job. It's been, you know, there's years between each interesting release and quite often they do something like Steve was talking about, the editing in anthology, I think the over reverb in Hollywood Bowl and the fact that they're not a separate 1964 and 65 concert, which they could do because only one of the 65 shows was bad in terms of technical stuff. You know, despite the fact that, you know, we might have complaints about individual releases, they really have put out quite a lot. And then you look at video, it's a whole other thing. I mean, I thought that the one set, um, the deluxe one with the two discs, you know, Mm. all those videos, I thought that was was a a very, really, a really necessary and good release because Mm -hmm. you want to see those promos and, you know, it's, it's important. There should be the Hollywood Bowl film. They should restore the soundtrack to what it was. And, um, yeah, you know, and, and, and documentary things like Anthology and Eight Days a Week, you know, are also important in terms of telling the story, you know, no matter what is done in little bits of the story being told, whatever criticisms I might, I might have. Um, I think that those two things were important things for people to see who don't live with the stuff day in and day out like we do. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Ken, you want to respond to any of that? Uh, I agree with just about everything Alan said there, except I, I honestly don't see the need for every outtake to come out. That's just me. You know, that me personally. I mean, yes, well, would I love to hear it? Absolutely. Uh, but again, I know it's the Beatles. Yeah, no, Ken, you know, you know, I, I would be, I would agree with you, and be, I'd be absolutely fine with that if they just send it all to me. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, ah, uh, yes. Um, okay. I mean, I, what can I say? I mean, you know, I think, I mean, the the issue of whether you know they should release everything. Um, you know, we can again, we can, yeah, we can sit here and talk about this. I mean. I don't know. I there's been there's been it just seems like there's never enough, you know. I mean, but I'm glad that they've cataloged everything. Uh, um, they should do that for if they haven't done it for all four of them, all four of the Beatles individually. They should. I, I would suspect they probably have. I think that's probably something that you do nowadays because. It's absolutely necessary. Yeah, see, a lot of it uh, isn't in hmm. isn't in EMI's or Apple's hands. It's a lot of it is in their hands individually. So it's sort of up to them to do. Oh, I see. You know. I don't see all four parties agreeing to releasing everything. Mm. I no. think we we just made a major breakthrough this year with Sgt. Pepper. Right. So um, you know, I think we're going to see more projects like that. I, I again, as we have we as we've said before. I don't think we'll see the extensiveness of Sgt. Pepper continued with everything. I think we can almost imagine if White Album is indeed going to be the next one, what White Album is, what the White Album is going to have, and you can you can probably, I mean that's kind of a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. We'll finally get those. We you know, we'll finally get those acoustic tracks. But um, I don't think you know. I mean, there's only so far they can go. But then again, the Sgt. Pepper thing sold really, really well. And so, you know, maybe that opened the door. You see, here's the thing. When it comes to the question of all the outtakes, 
the, que- the the first question you would have really would be what would their objection be? And their objection would be probably if there's something embarrassing. Um, and from the outtakes we've heard, you know, even when they make mistakes, it's kind of funny, not in a we're laughing at them for making mistakes way, but because they had such a sense of humor that comes through, particularly at times like that, they'll make a mistake and John will make a tart comment and it'll, you know, it'll just be funny and, and it, it, it's their personality is like infuses everything. And I think mm-hmm. that's, that's what undercuts the possibility of any kind of embarrassment for, you know, bad takes. Um, because there may be bad takes, there may be a breakdown, it, you know, and it just doesn't matter. You know, you know that that's what happens in the studio and they were funny about it when it did. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, of course, but you're yeah. expecting you're expecting the Beatles to feel the same way that you do. I can persuade them. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you guys, uh, based on what we know now, as opposed to what we knew at the beginning of the year when we hit this question then. What do you think we're getting for Christmas? Nothing, Alan. <laughs> yeah, I really. Mean, I, I haven't. I haven't heard any rumors of anything, and we know that they take a long time to do projects. So. Um, like we haven't heard any inklings of them doing, say, a magical mystery tour box or anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I think they've sort of left that to HMC, who, which has put out video outtakes, um, which are quite interesting, um, in some ways more interesting than the film itself. What they probably should do, since they've put out, just within recent years, a uh, uh, a restored magical mystery tour film is maybe edit an alternate magical mystery tour film like a- HMC did, but using you know the material they have in in crisp perfect shape, and show really what an interesting film it could have been. But I mean I haven't heard any rumors about that happening, and um, kind of like it's the middle of October, so I would be happily surprised, but surprised if they did come up with something for the holidays. Ken? Well, if you've noticed in recent years, you usually find out about a Beatles release very close to its release. You know, maybe, if you're lucky, a month before it comes out. Hmm. And um, that's what it's been like the last few years. If I was to think of anything that might come out, it would be something from Magical Mystery Tour. But I'm not just thinking about the movie itself. I'm thinking about the songs. I mean, Mm -hmm. you could do a remastered Magical Mystery Tour with outtakes of songs from there, although we've already gotten outtakes of Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane, which we talked about before. What do you do about that? Mm -hmm. But I haven't heard of anything. I haven't heard of anything uh, concrete, you know, but my my, uh, guess is that we'll get the White Album next year, and that's going to be the next big thing. Yeah, same here. I haven't heard anything concrete either. I hope they surprise us and come up with something though uh, i mean that would be that would be great god I, I still i don't know why but if anything comes out i'm still holding out for let it be on dvd that would be easy that would be but they might as probably, well save that for 2019 2020 well for what the, if i'm not around for 2020 but... what if i'm not around in 2020 well you just I'm, have to I'm, be I'm gonna, oh okay you know, gonna, I mean, hey, you well, know, I've got true. this deal wanna... about Helter Skelter, so uh, <laughs> you might as well have one about Let It Be. Okay. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, I'm, I was just sort of, you know, looking up, um, I haven't found it yet, but I was looking up how long before Pepper they released uh, the, the info about it when they put the press release out. It seemed like it was... It was... Only like three weeks or so, wasn't it? It it was more than that, I'm pretty sure. And even the Beatles 1, the Beatles 1 Plus, Mm -hmm. we found out pretty close to its release. It's pretty pretty guarded, this information. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. true. Yeah, that much is very true. I mean, they are, there used to be a time, and like, I mean, I've mentioned this before, where they would divulge stuff i mean uh, but uh, you know way back when i interviewed yoko the first time she told me about the john lennon box set that would never happen now 
Ringo talked about uh, um, it was a yellow submarine he talked about. Uh, they won't do it now. They will not. They will just flat out not say. Hmm. They want to keep. You know, they want the surprise. Well, which you is know, really they, kind of, they could do ahead. the Shea Stadium film. I mean, you know, they've. Uh, we don't know what the period of exclusivity for um, theater showing was around the time. You know, when they when they uh, brought out eight days a week, they, there was some sort of exclusive deal where it would only be shown in the theaters. But that I don't think was for you know perpetuity. I think that mm-hmm. was just for a period. Um, so, and, and they've had that ready since before the anthology. And so I'm sure if they've, you know, fixed it up a bit since, uh, that could come out. Well, here's something here, guys. Just looking on Amazon, I don't know what these are. There are a bunch of Beatles CDs coming December 15th. Hmm. It says forty six ninety nine, And it doesn't say yeah. what? It doesn't say what. It says huh. imports. It says imports, 2017. For the record, uh, uh, the Sgt. Pepper press release came out on April 5th. Okay. And that was due for June. Yeah. So or the very months. end of May. Almost. But there is, something, there is something coming December 15th. There's a ton of them. I would guess that these are maybe just uh, maybe SHMs uh, from Japan. Do they give a That's, label? The first – let me look at one of them. It says imports. Hmm. I mean, but they usually don't – they've gotten wise to the fact that people are looking at these things. So I don't know. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of curious uh, that those are there. Uh, there's nothing on DVD that's coming. So, But uh, there's a bunch of CDs, whatever they are. Hmm. So That's all we have to do, look on Amazon, <laughs> to find out when anything new is coming out now. Right, that's that's about it. That's about it. So, anyway, we are running cl- uh, right up close to the end of the hour, gentlemen. Let me uh, let's go one at a time. Um, Ken, uh, briefly tell everybody where people can get a hold of you. Uh, you can reach me at my email address, which is every little thing at att.net. You can always visit my website at kenmichaelsradio.com. If you could, I have a few things I need to plug because it's all happening this week and next week. Uh, you can actually win tickets on my website to see Joe Walsh in concert because he's performing at Mohegan Sun in their arena on November 3rd. This is part of his um, Vets Rock Tour. This will benefit the Connecticut USO and the Veterans Expo at Mohegan Sun. If you go to my website, I've got a contest running now through October 22nd. Very easy to win, so if you live in the New England area, if you want to see Joe Walsh at Mohegan Sun November 3rd, you can enter that contest on my website. I know I mentioned this the last couple of weeks. I have a special contest to win Brian Wilson's new compilation. I just wanted to wait until I got it in the mail. It's starting this Thursday, October the 19th. It's called Playback, the Brian Wilson Anthology on CD. And we had Ken Womack on our show not long ago. I did an interview with Ken, which is going to be on my website soon. But I'm now giving you the chance to win his new book on George Martin called Maximum Volume, The Beatles Producer George Martin, The Life of Beatles Producer George Martin, 1926 to 1966. That's on my Beatles trivia and games page. And one last thing, I was just interviewed on a wonderful podcast show, and it's called Friends of Dan podcast. Dan Miles is the host. He does incredible interviews. He's been doing this for several years, really in-depth interviews. I talked for over two hours talking about the Beatles. It's now posted on his website. If you get a chance, give it a listen. Uh, The website is friendsofdan.com, and it's also on iTunes. It's really a great interview show. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Alan, how can people get a hold of you? Um, probably the easiest way is on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, my alter ego. Okay. Okay. And you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have a Beatles news page called Beatles News and Information on Facebook. To get a hold of the show, you can uh, to yell at us uh, or compliment us or send us money. You can write to us at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We have uh, a Beatles um, things we said today uh, Beatles radio show page and a things we said today 
show page on Facebook, the the second page um, is tied in with the Fab Four Radio. Uh, dot com broadcasts uh, and thank you Matt for uh, broadcasting us every week and thank you to Michael Lynch for composing the theme song which we never pray we never credit but I'm I'm doing that now thank you Michael I think we've covered ev- all the bases and um, I think we are through so for Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you for listening and we will see you next time. Thank you.